Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. My name is Tom Ford, and I'm the chair and organiser of Grand Rounds. We have something a little bit different for you this week. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Suzanne Gray, who uh, is an Alzheimer's Scotland consultant nurse um, who, uh, and also a senior clinical teacher in the university. She reached out to me, I think end of last year to say that there was a, um, a body of work being done to look at uh, dementia in specifically orthopedic wards and asked if she could have a slot in the middle of the this year once the report had been finalized to come and disseminate that information. Now, I think this is a really interesting topic. Um, I think this is not going to be specifically orthopedics no. specific. I think that's just the wards they picked. Um, we know our population is getting older. We know our, anyone who works on the wards is acutely aware of the number of patients on the ward who have confusion, or it be acute chronic or acute on chronic. Our safety brief huddle every morning highlights the number of people on the ward who have an AWI or should consider one or people who have cognitive impairment. We know that these patients uh, can be more challenging to manage uh, at all levels, through from nursing through to and medical, uh, uh, precious ally to medicine, decision making, uh, discharge planning, consent capacity, all these things. So this impacts on all of us. And I think it's only going to impact on us more as time goes on. Uh, and I don't know what's in this talk. I haven't had any preview. Um, I know that Suzanne's going to share with us the redacted report. Um, we're going to, I'm sure we're going to talk about you know, the incidence of um, the impact and what we can do about improving care for people who have uh, cognitive impairment dementia. So I'm delighted to welcome Suzanne. Any questions, please put them in the chat uh, as usual or wait until the end where you can put up your hand uh, and ask in real life, um, albeit on a screen. And, uh, and again, yes, thanks very much, Suzanne. Uh, uh, it's all yours. Thank you. No, I'm not particularly great with Zoom, so I'm going to try and share the redacted report by sharing my screen. So if someone can tell me, and once I do this, I won't be able to see any of you. So if you can actually speak and, and tell me if you can see what I'm sharing. So just, then I'll, uh, be, I'll be the uh, I'll be the voice of the right. Uh, great. So let me see how I do this. So. OK. I've lost you all now. Hmm. We're not quite there yet. No. No, I seem to have managed to put you into a tiny little box. So I've got you back. Right. Share screen. Uh, here we go. Share. Okay. That looks more promising. There we go. We can see your Word document. So thanks. Okay. Go. Is it large enough? Can people see it? Uh, I've got terrible eyes and, uh, and I can see it. So I think we're all okay. Good. Right. Okay. I'll just see if I can increase it slightly. Yeah, okay. So this, um, I'm Suzanne, and I'm the oh, terrible title, Alzheimer's Scotland Dementia Consultant, and I'm a mental health nurse by background, and I've been in this post almost uh, two years. And although I have a clinical background, um, more recently, um, I was a nurse lecturer. So coming back into the NHS has been a massive learning curve for me. So this was the, the first sort of official piece of work that I was asked to do in my capacity in this role. And it was commissioned by um, Lee Robertson um, on the back of concerns that were raised um, by a family of a patient who had been in the acute services. And although the complaint had been resolved um, and the complaint involved all levels of care from nursing care through to medical care, through to AHPs, um, Although the the concern the complaint was resolved, there was certainly a lot of learning um, at the time, and um, a need to to scope what was really going on in the acute wards. So this started in January two thousand and twenty two, and very quickly, what what I became aware of was although um, I'd selected three wards. Um, the recommendations actually were just about just as much about process and were probably applicable to not just the acute wards, but 
um, specialist dementia units to Sopan Tayside. So a lot of the recommendations actually ended up being um, sort of strategic suggestions. So the aim of this scoping exercise was to, to provide the findings and recommendations to those three boards. But as I say, um, it actually grew arms and legs and, and took a great a long time to, to put together. Um, one of the things that did become very, very um, obvious was there was a need to st establish a dementia steering group to take forward the actions identified in the report, and we're working on that at the moment, and also to develop a really clear governance process, um, because um, there are um, national dementia standards, and there's a new dementia strategy due out this year. I think there's a possible delay on that at the moment. It was going to be May or June, but I think it's going to take a wee bit longer. Um, and there's a new sign guideline um, for supporting people with dementia just about to come out. I was involved in that group too. So it's it's a, an opportune moment to be looking at our, our care and our processes and seeing how we can, how we can improve because there's always room to improve. The other thing that um, came up in the, during the report was it was actually really like, difficult to identify in the wards who had a diagnosis of dementia. There was an over-reliance on um, the AWI, the Section 47 forms, and a lot of the staff that I spoke to, if someone had that yellow form in their notes, oh, they must have dementia. But of course, um, there are other reasons that you can, can um, not have capacity at a given time, um, including delirium. So um, I'm... I'm also in the, the process of trying to um, put a, an alert on track here for people who actually have a diagnosis of dementia, because of course, if we don't know that, we don't know how many people are in the hospital, then we can't, we can't, how do we improve our services if we don't know how many people are in the wards at any given time? We don't know how many transfers they've had, which we know transfers is a terrible thing for people with dementia in hospitals. And we don't know how long, how long they're staying in hospitals or the outcomes for them. So how did we actually go about um, doing this? So it was a mixed methodology. So um, we wanted to ensure that feedback was gathered from the widest range of stakeholders possible. And that included people with dementia and their family carers, but also MDT staff. Um, but this was working in acute wards. And um, the way we went about this was, was um, I observed care, I shadowed a lot of different staff, discussed with all relevant stakeholders and also carried out an audit of documentation comparing um, where medical staff would, would document and where nursing staff and where MDT staff, um, EHP staff would um, document. And there were some glaring differences. And then I carried out an environmental audit regarding the dementia friendliness of the wards. So in total, there were nine visits to the wards between January and April, 2022. Um, and five key themes emerged from the discussions with people with dementia over the three wards, and those were their experiences with staff, communication, sharing care, boredom and waiting around, and the environment. And the five themes were actually mirrored by visitors, family members and unpaid carers. And overwhelmingly, what staff <clears throat> on the ground were saying to me was they, they wanted to have more time to spend with people with dementia. But that was um, particularly over COVID and the aftermath of COVID um, and staff shortages and staff being moved. There was also a question around the efficacy of the the measurement, the tools that are used um, regarding um, dependency levels in patients. Um, so that's a whole nother, other can of worms, really. So how did we how did we go about actually, you know, measuring and and observing if if we were meeting standards? So that so we looked at the Healthcare Improvement Scotland care of older people and hospital standards. Now they're just being revised at the moment, so it's the the existing ones that we used, and those were mapped against um, the local um, delivering services for frail older people. I also mapped this against the standards for dementia care and um, also the principles for general practice working with care homes. Um, and that's because this was previous work that had been done through the Older People's Clinical Board and the Older People's Acute Forum. So the key findings, we'll just um, mention these and talk around them a wee bit for you. Um, standard one, improvements are required in the use and completion of that section 47 form, which I, I mentioned. 
And um, there seems to be um, a tendency for anyone who is um, has a has a diagnosis of dementia that automatically they get this section 47 put in place. Now, not everybody with dementia is incapable of making decisions. And, you know, lack of capacity is not an all encompassing concept. It's particular to to the decision or the situation that the person's in. Um, so I think we need to be really mindful of that. Um, because if we, we just blanket give everybody this um, Section 47 form, then we're actually infringing people's human rights. The other concerns that I have, and I will take these concerns um, to the relevant people and the relevant teams, but there's no, there's no, there's no place on this form to revoke the form. So, um, you know, sometimes people are, are on these, it's usually, I think, three months I've seen documented on the forms, but it can be an awful lot longer. Um, so, you know, maybe we need to be reviewing the actual form. Standard two is one that's very, very close to my heart. There is a need to embed a person-centred approach to caring for people with dementia. Now, what I did witness myself was um, teams working very, very well, but working in silo. So we need to be much more flexible and we need to be working together, particularly when it comes to transferring people from hospital to hospital. Um, we need to put the person at the centre and be a bit more flexible. Um, standard three, there's a document, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but um, hopefully this will bring your attention to it. I'm also in the group that's reviewing that in the moment. Um, the getting to know me document is a bit like a passport, tells you basic information about that person that's an icebreaker, it's a conversation prompt and can actually relieve um, a lot of stress and distress, particularly when you're you're providing person-centred care or personal care for someone and we should be using that a lot more. So um, again there's been uh, some difficulties with that, I discovered that had been taken off our PCOS ordering system, so uh, I'm in the process of getting it back on there. Um, and we should all be um, asking families or the person themselves if they're able to to complete this form and this should be following that's the person's own uh, possession it's their documents not an NHS document it's the individual's document and that should follow them through their journey and help people to understand maybe what's what's creating stress or distress for that person standard four um a need for provision of the opportunity to take part in meaningful activities. One of the biggest problems um, that people with dementia face when they come into hospital is they become medically fairly well, but they can't move on or the care package that they previously had at home has, has been redistributed to someone else. So they end up stuck in a hospital. Now, I don't know about you, but I have been in hospital fairly recently and two days was enough for me. And I was absolutely bored. There's a need to be doing some kind of work with people that empowers people with dementia so they don't lose those skills that they have. I mean, there's some horrendous statistics around about the amount of people with dementia who come in to acute hospital care, having lived independently at home and then never get back home. So there's something wrong. There's something wrong with our systems and there's something wrong with the way that we, we are or maybe aren't rehabilitating people with dementia. And I've spoken about this before, number five, a need for all teams to work in collaboration, placing that person with dementia at the centre of the care. At the end of the day, how would you want to be treated and how would you want your care to be if you were that person? Standard six, there's a need to increase understanding, guidance and sharing of knowledge, particularly around both non-pharmacological and pharmacological interventions for people experiencing stress and distress. So uh, what I see, and again, this is actually not from Nine Wells, it's actually something that I saw in Perth Royal Infirmary, but the use of um, additional staff to observe people um, who are distressed and the use of agency staff and a lot of the time these staff are just sitting watching or observing the person they're not interacting with the person and that, you know there's such a waste of, of um, valuable time there that we could be working alongside that person to, to um, preserve their abilities and again um, I'm working with Health Improvement Scotland um, to try and try and take that work forward there's um, a pilot going on in Ward 1 in PRI and um, I think it's one of the orthopaedic wards in Nine Wells, but I need to catch up with the advanced nurse practitioner about that. 
But there does seem to be, there are guidance um, along pres prescribing that I'm not a nurse prescriber, um, but I know that Cara McDonald, um, old age psychiatrist, have put together almost a flow chart of what, what type of medication um, would be useful when someone's stressed and distressed, but always, always, um, that should be a last resort. We should be using non-pharmacological interventions. And that's where that getting to know me document becomes so important. So you know the person's last occupation, you can reminisce with them, you can get them involved in doing, doing things that are meaningful activities for that person. Okay. Standard seven, all documentations should clearly identify people with a cognitive impairment. And I've touched upon that already. Um, sitting on several national groups um, and having seen the draft dementia strategy document, which um, unfortunately I'm not permitted to share with anybody at the moment, um, there is going to be a need for us to provide data. So um, I've been working with Lee Robertson um, about an alert on track here, similar to the alert that's there for Parkinson's disease, um, so we can start gathering data around um, who are our patients and and the the, the amount of people who have who have dementia. Um, standard eight, yes, absolutely. I need to increase staff understanding of the three Ds and pain, delirium, dementia, depression, and pain. Um, and I've been involved in providing. Um, mainly nurses, I think, um, new start nurses, um, the three Ds, um, very happy to, to fit in with any medical training, um, if that would be useful at all, um, to go over that. Standard uh, nine, there are inconsistencies in understanding and supporting the people with dementia experiencing stress and distress. And I think one of the stress and distress sessions that I run, uh, the key message is moving from a managing people with dementia to an understanding of people with dementia. What is triggering that person to behave in that way? Why is that person behaving in that way? What can we do to mitigate that? And what can we actually do to prevent that happening in the first place? But we have to want to understand what's going on, not just manage the problem. We need to, to dig a lot deeper. Standard 10, there's a need for more collaboration between services and review of documentation, including electronic signifiers with a focus upon re-enablement. I think I've touched upon all of that already. Then standard 13, discharge planning should take account of the additional needs of people with dementia. So again, that's touching on um, increased needs, um, trying to avoid too many moves, but trying to take that, that rehabilitative approach with a person with dementia. Standard 14, there's a need to clearly and accurately measure the needs of people with dementia in terms of staffing numbers and the time required to deliver person-centered care. So this is back to the point that I made earlier about the tools that we're using um, that define staffing levels. Are they actually reflecting the needs of people with dementia? There was a ward that I was in, and I'm, I'm in and out of this ward um, often. It's an acute um, MFE ward. and um, I think of 25 beds, 20 people um, had some level of confusion or a diagnosis of dementia. Um, and the, the staffing was, situation was, um, they had had staff taken away. Um, so we really need to, to look at that. And um, I have a senior charge nurse um, gathering data about that too. Um, and then standard 16, there's a need to develop a standardised pan t side approach to, to delivering dementia training, taking account of local needs. So um, I rather naively thought when I came into this role that we would um, be delivering dementia training to all staff in a similar way pan t side. That's not what's happening. There's lots of great training going on, but we need a more um, linked up strategic approach. So um, one of the pieces of work that I'm hoping to undertake is a, a scoping review um, of the, the actual training that does take part. It should, all of our training about dementia should be mapped to um, the Promoting Excellence Framework as four levels. Um, I would be expecting um, staff who are regularly working with people with dementia to at least be at the skill level on this framework. Um, so that's a huge piece of work that needs to go on, but 
on top of that, we do have dementia champions who are tend to be um, registered nurses. Um, they go on a, a, a course, a program, and have to um, make an actual change and uh, do some quality improvement work. Um, but there's a problem with the ongoing support of, of the nurses and them getting the time to fulfil their roles. So we've started up, and anyone is welcome to join us, we've started up a Tayside Dementia Forum. We meet every two months and we discuss um, pertinent uh, things about dementia, good practice, we share good practice and um, sometimes we have speakers um, so you're very welcome to to join that. I can I can give you the the uh, calendar diary invites for that. Um, the ward environments all require review as well. Um, the environments are not friendly um, at all. Covid has not helped that. Um, there's a really good example of dementia champion work in PRI um, she works in general outpatients, this nurse, and she noticed that people um, in the waiting area were sometimes being becoming quite distressed. So she um, got an artist in to paint the wall with local local um, landmarks, and it's a, a distraction and reminiscence tool, uh, but it's actually led to um, her reviewing the whole environment and taking down a lot of the unnecessary posters and making sure that the, the information that's really important that people should see is visible and, and um, adheres to, to what we call dementia friendly environmental standards. So there are pockets of some fantastic work going on. So the key recommendations were that we should have um, at strategic level two steering groups, um, one for people with dementia, one for people with delirium, that the older people acute forum should review the, the tools that I mentioned. The butterfly scheme uh, that's moved on slightly from now. Um, we're looking at alternatives to the butterfly scheme because um, current evidence would suggest that that these kind of approaches aren't best. We, we're better looking to a, a more person-centered approach to meeting the needs of people with dementia because no two people are the same, and everyone will. If, if all of us in this Zoom call, goodness, you know, we're we're diagnosed with dementia. We would, if we even if we all had Alzheimer's type dementia, we would all experience it differently. Um, and the environmental audits, yes, um, they're going to be discussed between myself and the lead nurses and at the Older People Acute Forum and be presented to the Older People Clinical Board. And we should be um, encouraging regular aud auditing at ward level. When it comes to relationships, we need to be working much more collaboratively. We need to be supporting our dementia champions. And there's been new um, post band four staff, and really the band four staff are in a great position to be able to, to be offering these activities and that rehabilitative approach to people with dementia who are in hospital. We do need to be um, involving our carers and our families much more. Um, we should be seeing them as partners in care, not as a, an adjunct. Um, and we should be looking at the use of volunteers. We could be, um, I think, um, exploring how to widen their role a bit. And I've already mentioned the, the getting to know me and trying to promote that. In terms of performance management, I keep going on about it, but it's really important that we start gathering some gate data. Um, clinical guidance, um, I'm working with his at the moment to look at what do we actually do with people when we're observing them, when they're, when they're distressed. Um, and we're going to review um, some of the, the guidance for the um, non-pharmacological and pharmacological interventions for people who are, who are stressed or distressed. Um, something that really shocked me, um, and I think it's because I've been out of the NHS for a while, was clinical meetings taking place in communal areas where other patients can hear what's being discussed. I was actually at one um, such meeting and a relative <laughs> and a patient walked through the middle of the meeting and nobody flinched. I know it's difficult. I know that sometimes we're reliant upon the information on boards and boards are placed in, you know, areas that don't, you know, don't help us to be confidential. But please, please, please um, be very aware um, of where we're having discussions of what we're actually discussing. And then the documentation, the, the nursing notes are, are going um, electronic, which is fantastic. Um, they will contain guidance prompts for the 4AT um, and also for the Getting to Know Me documents. Um, delirium, 
we should have a separate group looking at delirium. We should be looking at the sign guidance that exists for delirium. And uh, dementia training, education and resources, as I've said, um, we need a pan T side approach to this. When it comes to the management of this change, um, we should be exploring potential models of provision to ensure that people with dementia do not become de-skilled. And that means that we need to look at the patient pathway. So let's once we get the, the steering group established, let's explore alternative pathways for people with dementia. And we want to minimise the moves and we don't want people in hospital who don't need to be and we don't want them staying longer than they need to be. And then everything that we do um, should be underpinned by a person-centred framework. And there's a, a framework called VIPS, and I'm sorry, I can't remember what the VIPS stands for at the moment, um, but um, that these principles underpin the implementation of the recommendations of this scoping report. And that's it. So I'm now going to try and stop sharing. Okay, that's me. Thank you, Suzanne. I just need to activate bits and pieces again, get back on again. There I am. So thank you very much for taking us through that. Um, lots to think about. And I think uh, some points in there that will chime with many of us, most of us, in terms of uh, our own clinical practice and how we approach things. I, I think that there are a, at least one MFE consultant in the in the virtual room who is far more expert in this than I would ever profess to be. Um, I think most of us would say that you know, if we are in a clinical role, we see a lot of people with cognitive impairment, be it acute, chronic, acute on chronic whether it's dementia or whether it's a delirial, delirium state, increasingly commonly. I don't think any of us would profess to be you know, true experts in this area. Um, and as a chest physician, not something I trained in, in any great depth 15 years ago. Um, and so it's very challenging, very challenging. Um, so I think this is absolutely fantastic that this, this work has been done and to highlight things and bring, bring to our attention and try to take things forward. Now, there's one comment um, from the enigmatically named 806940, um, who asks, I wonder if you could pass on the flowchart in regards to medication from Dr. McDonald, as we in Surgical Acute Frailty Team haven't seen it. Okay. So once you've decoded who 806960 <laughs> is, I'm sure they'd be grateful. Um, it's Vicky Richmond. She says. Oh, right. OK. OK. If that helps. <clears throat> Vicky Richmond, I better write that down. <laughs> okay, does anybody in the audience have any comments, questions, queries, personal experience, ideas? Be interested to hear anybody who would have more experience than I do in this area. Um, Sarah Cobb, uh, I'm sorry, Sarah, I don't know what your role is, but you've told us working on a busy MFE ward, I think improvement in the care of dementia patients is vital. However, we are so often scuppered by the lack of nursing staff and removal of staff to yeah. other areas. Basic nursing is still a struggle. And I think until this is put in place, other projects won't be successful. That's Sarah Love. Um, that makes sense. So she's one of our MFE consultants. So, yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I completely take on board what Sarah's saying. And I would be the first person um, to advocate for more staff and staff not being moved from, from particular wards that have, have lots of older people with with cognitive impairment but there are some sometimes I do see um just a, taking a slightly different approach can actually you know spending a couple of minutes with someone and reassuring them um can actually pay dividends in the long run um often it's just about approaching somebody smiling something as simple as that not looking harassed even if you are and sometimes I think we lose sight of that and I'm not being critical of staff because I actually think staff, when I came into this job, it was it was mid-COVID and um, I was actually flabbergasted at how the staff were coping and continue to cope. And I'm, I'm really in awe of all the staff that work in the wards. But there are sometimes very small things we can do. And even having the getting to know me completed and having a quick look at that before you actually start to to talk with the person or provide any kind of support can make a huge difference. A huge difference. You know, just saying, oh, I see you've got a wee dog, your wee dog's called Archie or something, and it puts the person at ease. That doesn't take a, a great deal of time. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, C. Jollins, I'm going to say from the username. Does NHS Tayside have a guideline covering physical restraint? Should the acute management of a delirious, confused patient warrant that? Difficult area for all of us. Nobody wants to restrain anybody, but when risk to others, risk to other patients, risk to staff, risk to each other, and risk to the individual is, I mean, that, that clearly is a thing. So what, is this your area, Suzanne, any comments? No, not really. Um, I'm not aware of anything that's specific to people with dementia um, regarding physical restraint. I mean, obviously that's that's absolutely the last thing that we would ever want to be doing to someone, to anybody. Um, I have been involved in looking at the enhanced observation policy um, for the one that we had in mental health services um, really had been written a wee while ago and it was based on adult psychiatry and it, it didn't really meet the needs of older people, particularly older people who needed enhanced supervision over a, a, a longer time. Um, so that has been reviewed. One of the things, again, that I'm hoping the steering group will take forward is to look at that policy in terms of acute um, general hospital. Um, but it, it was more about seclusion um, rather than that actual management of someone who's being aggressive, who has dementia. But thank you for highlighting that as something that I will, I will look into because I don't think there is anything specific, no. Okay, thanks very much. Anybody else got any questions? Anybody want to just uh, stick a hand up, turn on camera, speak in real life? Just flick through there. Nope. I mean, I would be interested in hearing um, what, what your challenges are and what you think the priorities are. Well, whilst everyone else plucks up the, the courage to type some of that in um, or put their hand up, I'm on I'm on like a consultant on call for the ward or one of the two of us this week and our challenge in, in the respiratory ward is throughput we're very busy we, we, mm -hmm. we admit a lot of people every day we discharge a lot of people every day so we're busy in turnaround um so that, that's two points I'd make from that first is because we have a lot of new patients they take up a lot of our time so the patients who are there are longer stay patients who are often confused point of impairment get less time there's mm -hmm. only so many hours of the day and you know, the priority goes to the people who you don't know and are acutely unwell and are fresh to the door. So that's a problem for us, just not enough time. And that, I think, it talks to Sarah's uh, comments about staffing levels and, and just generating time. But also, I, the patients with cognitive impairment, confusion, acute or chronic, whichever, will have, in a, a five-day stay, may have seven or eight people in the bed opposite them. You know, or they may, or the bay may change completely. We may have five people come and go in that, and they, and that's. To, I wonder if that's as bad as boarding someone. You know, so as bad as moving them to a completely different environment. Um, I mean, one one of the things that that some some staff, when I've spoken to them, were quite surprised at was that we could we we know that we can induce delirium in people without having a a physical, you know, like an infection or dehydration or or constipation or anything like that. It can actually be done by change of of people around the person, change of carers. Um, so well, I, I, we, we definitely see that. We see yeah. so so frequently someone comes in with no issues at all, and then on the second morning at our huddle, Mrs. Miggins has been very confused overnight. Yeah. Um, and that's just out of the blue. Um, and that becomes a real challenge for us to, to to manage and deal with, and and particularly for my nursing colleagues who are there all the time, mm -hmm. I get I get to walk away. I've got other things that, but it's a real challenge. I mean, uh, the, 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 there was one <laughs> there was one situation. There was a lady in a, a side room who was delirious, um, and she was um, absolutely convinced that the staff were standing outside her door talking about her and blaming her for for a car accident that happened. And um, when I actually looked into this, staff were actually standing outside her door talking about her, um, you know, because she was very close to the nursing station. And they were talking about a car crash that happened, you know, so sometimes we just need to, you know, some people say to me, is it better to have someone with dementia in a side room or 
or in abeyance? Well, that depends on the needs of that individual. There is no set answer that's going to meet everybody's needs. But, you know, in, in that case, I, I, I suspect that lady might have been better out of a side room. Um, but of course, COVID has has impacted upon that too, you know, if someone has has COVID. Um, but, you know, some sometimes the environments that we're in, I always, when I'm providing training, I always say, say to people, at some point, stop. Stop in the middle of mealtime or something and just listen to the noise levels. And imagine if you were misinterpreting that noise or you're a bit disorientated to time, place. You know, why, you know, we we just need to try and step into the shoes of the person with dementia a bit more to understand, um, you know, try and understand where they're coming from, what their experience is. Sorry, I'm I'm trying to multitask here, looking at the the chat. There are a couple more questions, and, 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 yeah. and the, the questions don't translate onto the YouTube channel, so I will read them out. I'm sorry for it being lots of my voice, but here we go. Rachel from Author Geriatrics missed the start but agree that minimizing moves are vital but bed pressures often put this out of our control and i would add to this and i'm not trying to be provocative too much perhaps a little bit of devil's advocacy in this is that we try very hard not to board people with cognitive impairment of any sort be it chronic and stable waiting for care or acute and certainly acute confusion but we're the only ward that can look after chest drains and the only ward that can look yeah. after an IV or, I mean, that's slightly hyperbolic, but that, you know, there's other priorities. And then we, we make tough decisions. Do we, we, do we bring the person with a chest drain and board a confused person who's chronically confused at their baseline, for example, yeah. or, or do we have to board someone with a chest drain to a critical care unit? So that those decisions are not straightforward and, yeah. and we have a lot of competing interests. I think we recognize that. Yeah. And, and then, um, uh, we're back to 806940, who is Vicky Richmond. Vicky. Uh, apologies as technology won't allow speakers and microphone. More education in regards to management to all staff will be helpful. More in-person sessions rather than online, acknowledging that this is online, um, uh, allows opportunity for questions to be asked and scenarios to be discussed, um, and always happy to join us in tea trolley teaching again. Looks like I have to buy more cakes, Vicky. <laughs> More cake, more, more or tea trolley biscuits, perhaps. Um, I think um, uh, Louise Burton, co friend and colleague in MFE, uh, she says, having comms issues with audio and camera on the RVH computers, um, very interesting paper. I think having dementia patients tagged in track will be very helpful to highlight to staff. Also in uh, the getting to know me document, is there an electronic version of this or plans to have an electronic copy uploaded? A lot of times the documents don't follow the patients. Yeah, so I actually had a, a focus group with people with dementia and their carers uh, last week um, about the Getting to Know Me document. And we we asked that very question, should we be going down the electronic route? And it was felt very strongly that we shouldn't um, be for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons being that not all, well, it's predominantly older that people have, dementia not all people are are it savvy um and that how do you ensure that an electronic document is updated because it's the person's document it's not an nhs document um so it's it's easier to update it if it's a paper copy but i do know that what some of the staff have been doing is that they scan the document in and have an electronic copy so you could do that if you want to but there will always be a paper copy the other thing that was um, muted, so we'd put out a, a, a survey um, to staff about um, the format of the Getting to Know Me. If, not, if you haven't seen it, it's an A4 size um, booklet and it's um, sort of mustardy yellow background with black and some red font on it. So we looked at the colours and we looked at the size of it and everything and the staff had said that it might be better as a passport, you know, shaped and sized like a passport. But overwhelmingly, when we spoke to people who dimension their carers said no, um, because they thought they would just lose it um, or it would get lost in hospital. Um, and how do you update that? It'd be a lot more costly as well. And then how do the staff scan that? It's much more difficult to scan. So overwhelmingly, people were actually quite happy with the way the document was at the moment. Um, what they want is the guidance for completing it on the front page rather than the back page. Um, I agree a lot of the times the documents don't follow the patients and that's something I think once we finish the review 
of the getting to know me, I think there'll be a big um, push, a big education push on trying to get staff to make sure that, that documents go back to the person and they follow the person. But I, I, I completely agree that it is a problem. Right, thanks very much. Um, I can't see any more questions. I can see no hands and no ca cameras turned on. I, that's generated some discussion there, Suzanne, and I, and I, I think um, there's some genuine enthusiasm for what the work you're doing and some a lot of questions still, and I think there's a lot of challenges here, a lot of challenges, a lot of competing interests, and I think that yeah. it, needs, it needs a lot more work, but this is a really good start, and, and thank you very much for coming on to Grand Rounds and, and talking to us all about it. Very grateful. Thanks for the opportunity, Tom. Thank you. My, my pleasure, my pleasure. Um, and if you would like time to come back again and if anybody is has a burning uh, sort of little project in this area or any area that they want to talk about grand rounds please do get in touch because there's always slots going forward uh, i think there's an empty slot in two weeks in fact so if you've got a burning thing in your pop back pocket then do get back in touch and suzanne pl please do feel free to come back you know with an update of this and okay. perhaps some clinical cases or some of your colleagues in orthogeriatrics or, or mfe who might have some working examples of, of how we can make things better okay. and that'd be really welcomed. Next week we welcome Dr Fiona Drimmy um, in her role as Associate Postgraduate Dean of the Scottish Deanery. She's one of the um, trainee support and development team uh, and well-being team. I think I've got those in the wrong order. TSWS. Anyway, she'll get it right even if I get it wrong. Um, the part of the team that help with uh, trainees uh, and their development, their well-being, um, and uh, she's going to be joined by, uh, I think, Jordan Napier uh, from the DME team, and by Achit Valuri, uh, who is one of the TPDs in acute medicine, uh, and ACCS, who's going to talk about support for international medical graduates, a very interesting area because we are very keen in the deanery. Uh, to improve differential attainment, particularly for our IMGs and for doctors from a black and ethnic minority background. So tune in for that next week. Um, again, Suzanne, thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'll see you, see you next time. Thank you. Bye.